be recording this. So hello, welcome. My name is Colleen Igo. I'm with the York County System of Care. And I'm gonna ask, uh, thank you, Donna. Just a few tips I just wanted to let you know um, to get the most out of this presentation. Um, if you wanna um, be able to see the viewer, the speaker, and then also the presentation, just recommend that you switch your screens and you can easily see at the top of your screen, um, there's options for a speaker view uh, versus a side-by-side. -side. So you can get to see the pre presenter and also the slides. And we ask you that um, for, as far as if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to put those questions or comments in the chat because they will be monitored throughout the presentation. Um, and if there's something that you really would like a direct answer to right away, just uh, drop a note in the chat and we can answer those questions. I just, um, as I said, I'm, I'm Colleen and I'm with the System of Care. Whoops, sorry about that. I just wanted to give you a brief overview. Um, what we do as a System of Care is we try to bring all of the um, organizations and families and community around the table to talk about ways that we can better improve the system and all, all of our services and programs for families. Um, and with that, it's called the system of care. And one of the ways that we do this is just by getting groups together, like you'll see tonight with Brittany and Matt and Donna, and they're going to share the um, various ways that their organizations help our community. So we're really excited to be a sponsor of this, and we thank you for being part of it. And if you're interested in learning more about system of care, just put your name in the chat box and I can send more information to you. So with that, I would like to introduce to you, Brittany Schutz. She is with um, the York um, Opioid Collaborative. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, as you said, my name is Brittany Schutz. I'm with the York Opioid Collaborative. We are a nonprofit organization here in York working to combat the impact of substance use. And tonight I have um, two of my colleagues with me. So Matthew Nall, which is with Gadenzia, one of our treatment providers here in the Commonwealth as well as um, surrounding areas. And Donna Krieger with um, Drug Free Workplace. So she'll be, each of them will be talking a little bit more about what they do with their organization um, and presenting on the content throughout tonight. So tonight's discussion is going to sorry, focus on um, what can we do? What can we do as a community? What can we do as parents, as caregivers to engage our children in drug and alcohol awareness? Sorry, my so, I apologize. My computer is going crazy. It's not gonna be indicative of how this night's gonna go. I promise you that, okay. So we wanna begin with just a statistic. So nine out of 10 people with a substance use disorder start using an addictive substance by the age of 18. So what does this mean for our youth? So tonight we're gonna to talk about why do kids start using? What is a substance use disorder? What are the risk and protective factors really relation to developing a substance use disorder? as well as what can we do as a community, as caregivers, as parents, um, to empower our youth and educate our youth about the risk factors and engage in protective factors. So throughout this presentation, we will be referencing various content um, from the Pennsylvania Youth Survey. So if you're not familiar with PACE, um, the Pennsylvania Youth Survey is conducted every other year in sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th grade. Um, it is a voluntary survey um, and school districts can decide to participate in it and provide it to their students. Um, it is offered to any school district that's willing to participate. And PAYS is our primary tool in Pennsylvania to use data to drive decision-making when it comes to prevention. Um, and so throughout this presentation, we will mostly be referencing York County data. However, if you're from a different county, I would encourage you to visit um, the PAYS website and you can look through the data. You can look at previous year's reports as well. If you don't have a history of navigating the PAYS data, you can also reach out to your county partners and there might be some presentations and individuals can help you to understand it. Also PAYS data is available to individual school districts to look at your school district level data. That is um, not open to the entire county or the public, but individual school districts do have that ability to look at their data and utilize it to inform their response. 
So to begin, we just wanted to do a brief overview of two specific data um, sets that come out of the PACE data. And this is looking at early initiation and lifetime use of substances. This specific slide is breaking down alcohol, marijuana, and inhalants. So in the PACE data, it asks questions. It asks children their perceptions of use by their peers, by adults, um, their willingness to use, their perceived risk with those substances, as well as initiation and lifetime use and 30-day use. So this specific side, slide is asking how often are they vaping? How, how um, Sorry, this slide is asking how often are they using alcohol? How often marijuana inhalants? Uh, next slide. And so this slide breaks down tobacco and vaping trends. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these specific data sets. We'll be going into things a little bit deeper further on in the presentation. But just to give you an overview of what are the trends happening right now with youth in York County related to lifetime use of substances. And so alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, prescriptions, um, what are we seeing? What are youth reporting? that they are using, um, and this is 2019 data. So I'm gonna turn things over now to my partners on this presentation. Um, so Matt, I believe you are up next. All right, thank you so much, Brittany. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I know everyone has very busy lives and we appreciate you guys taking the time uh, for this. And we hope that you are able to walk away with some good tools to use. Um, so the first thing we wanna take a look at is understanding why. Why might um, kids turn to drugs and alcohol? So this is where we're gonna make this as interactive as we possibly can using Zoom. And we would like you in the chat box is to put some of the reasons why you think kids might turn to drugs and alcohol. Now, here's my little disclaimer. We have a wide range of people on here. And some of you, maybe you've seen one of my presentations before, might know where we're going with this. Um, but what are some of those iconic things that we've heard over the ages, or maybe that you were even told uh, while you were a youth, of why kids turn to drugs and alcohol? So go ahead, hop in that chat, and just kind of put some of those things why you think some uh, our adolescents or youth might turn to drugs and alcohol. So we have some peer pressure early childhood trauma, abuse, curiosity, great one, anxiety, depression, stress relief. Parents do it. Wow, good one. Family member use. Some peer pressure some more. Mm -hmm. Genetics. Boredom. Our kids aren't bored, are they? <laughs> Not with this pandemic going on. We'll give you about five more seconds. Experimenting, Experimenting. yes. And seem doomed, oh my. That's huge, Jane, thank you for sharing that. Yes. So often when I'm, you know, I go all over, um, Pennsylvania and work with a lot of different communities, helping them out. And, um, you know, I, and I hear some of our community leaders stand up and, and parents will say, why are our kids in New York, in your county or wherever, you know, turning drugs and alcohol? And sometimes we get this list up and what many of them were commented on. Um, our kids are bored. Come on. What's there to do here in your county? There's nothing for our kids to do or experimenting. They just don't know better. They don't know about the dangers of drugs and alcohol. Those uh, drug dealers, they're really pushing, you know, drugs on our kids. Here, take this or I'm going to beat, beat you up. They just want to fit in. Um, rite of passage, come on. We all smoked a little weed when we were growing up. It, it, it's okay. Um, now, is there some validity to that list? I think there is. However, when we sit down and we talk to kids, here's the list that kids give us of why they or their peers are turning to drugs and alcohol. Obviously this list 
really goes on and on. We could we could add a ton more to this, but I think that you get the idea where we're going with it. And when you hear that come from kids, that's powerful. That's really powerful. And it also helps us navigate and develop a plan of how we can help them. Now that first list, that iconic one of their board and experimenting and things, we definitely want to not negate them. However, this really steers us in that there's a bigger picture here. And that mental health concern that many of you commented on is, is very valid. Now taking a look at this list, I wanna kind of highlight three of them, depression, anxiety, and self-medication. Um, those are the, like the three key ones that we definitely hear the most about. So let's take a little bit about, uh, take a look at uh, depression right now. When we take a look at our PAYS survey, and again, as Brittany said, you can pull this up for your area. We take a look at the second column there, the second chart, felt depressed or sad most days in the past 12 months. Wow, over 40% of our student body reporting that there's some form of depression. Now, sometimes I get asked, Matt, do these kids even know what depression is? Are they just going through puberty or high school is kind of tough? But when we talk to a lot of the counselors, they're like, no, this definitely corresponds to the number of the kids that we have that have been diagnosed with depression. I just actually heard this, uh, I think last night on, on the radio that Microsoft even did a little survey to, to kids. And they were saying that 70% of the kids that they actually surveyed were coming back that they have a real mental health concern. Later, we're gonna comment about COVID and how this is playing a role in this as well. The first column there is self-harm, which goes along with this as well. The number of kids that might be um, cutting, burning themselves and doing some other self-harm. Um, so I get asked a lot, you know, Matt, how can we have a big impact on this? In my eyes, until we do more with this depression issue, our school bullying's not going to go away. Um, suicide rate is not going to change. School shootings is not going to change. And our drug and alcohol use is not going to change as well. This is really, really scary to me, to, to be honest. Now, is there a correlation between um, depression and drugs and alcohol? Absolutely. Here we have some good uh, statistics of the use of someone that does not have depressive symptoms opposed to those with moderate and high depression symptoms. And we can see that it's four times higher their likelihood of turning to drugs and alcohol when they have the, those feelings inside. So it's really important that um, all of us, anybody that cares about kids, even if you have them, you work with them, you know, or you just care about kids, is to really focus on that and see ways that we can, we can help them. So uh, with this PACE data, um, we also take this right into, and, and this was already commented about, the, the suicide rates. Um, and right now, um, with COVID, uh, we're hearing a lot more that's, um, I, I'm kind of scared to see where this is going to be going um, over the next couple of years as a result of that. Um, but we can see that, you know, our youth um, being very concerned about this and thinking about uh, harming themselves in a major way. And that's a scary thing. So um, sometimes um, we as grownups just think um, when a, a boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with, with, you know, a youth or, you know, they got picked on and oh, you're going to, you're going to get over it. Right. And they're going to go out. But in a teen's mind, they're always at 100%, always at 100%. And it might seem like a small thing to us in the big scope, but to them, it's the most important thing. So I'm going to now turn it over to my friend, Donna. Thanks, Matt. And I think it's really important to have this understanding of that some kids are using drugs and alcohol for self-medication, right? And self-medication really is when you turn to drugs or alcohol or prescription drugs and use them to cope with a situation that you just find too stressful, too overwhelming. Um, we saw a huge increase in alcohol sales due to the pandemic when there was this, this threat of uh, liquor stores not closing down. Um, so we are a society that self-medicates. And the issue with self-medication that it really can turn into an addiction or a substance use disorder. So 
it moving forward and understanding how do we talk to kids about drug and alcohol awareness and how do we engage them? It's really important for us as adults to understand what addiction is, right? What is substance use disorder? So this is a little substance use disorder 101. And we do know that addiction is a disease. It is a chronic brain medical disorder. It is not a moral failing. It's not a character flaw. It is not just because kids made a bad choice. Um, there's more to it than that. And we have to start seeing it as a disease. This quote I really think is powerful. It says, we are going to lose an entire generation. Let that sink in. We're going to lose an entire generation because we treat them like they're bad when they're sick. Right. And that was from Tammy Taylor. She is the founder and principal of Recovery High School just outside of Boston. Um, and they actually, she actually, there's this document, um, documentary series on MTV called 16 and Recovering. And I don't know if they're still playing it. You might be able to get it on demand, but it's pretty eye opening about these kids. Um, Right, and you know, Mara, we are going to, we're gonna to touch on that genetic um, and that predisposal of, of having that family history. So let's get into um, the science of addiction and how it impacts our brain. So we do know that it is a medical disorder, right? Back in 1994, um, in my prime time, y'all, um, there were two doctors, doctors Volkow and Shelbert, and they actually ran PET scans of the brain that showed the effects of substance use over time. And it, it showed that over time, it weakens brain tissue, it damages brain tissue, and it, it actually changes behavior. Um, and a lot of times that behavior is morally wrong, like lying and stealing and manipulation, those kind of things um, that we can't really wrap our mind around, that they're participating in these um, negative behaviors. How can it be a disease? Why isn't it a choice? Well, we know that it affects two areas of our brain, um, the limbic system and the cortex. We're going to start with the limbic system. And you can see here in my two little brains, not that I have a little brain or you have a little brain, but on here, there's two. Um, it's located deep within your uh, brain system, right above your brain cell, right? And our limbic system can also be called the primitive brain or the reptilian brain. I prefer to call it the gator brain. Okay, so the gator brain is where our basic survival instincts and our motivations happen, right? So anytime we participate in food, water, shelter, sex, caring for our young, those are all of our survival motivations, right? And so in this region, when we participate in that, there is a feel good chemical. And if you know it, put it in the chat box, everybody at once, what is that feel good chemical? I'm gonna tell you before you put it in, dopamine. There we go, good job, Frank. Dopamine, so dopamine provides a reward when you participate in something that feels good. And that reward uh, creates a pathway. And it tells our brain that we need to seek those um, survival motivations again. It sends a signal to the amygdala in the hippocampus, which actually records a memory of that. So we do indeed um, seek it again. This is literally our survival hardwiring, okay? So if it feels good, it must be good for us. We can kind of see the danger in that, right? Um, so then what happens is once substances like drugs and alcohol are introduced, they um, react, they produce the same dopamine process as our survival instincts. Um, that process happens. And so they're providing a reward. The trouble is they provide it at much higher levels. And what happens then is it affects our prefrontal cortex, which is where all of our executive functioning skills like decision-making, rational thought, critical thinking, impulse control, all of those processes happen in our thinking brain, or as I like to call it, the professor. So what starts happening when we introduce substances at higher levels 
it weakens the prefrontal cortex and it produces so much dopamine that it actually hijacks our brain. So we're no longer thinking with our professor, we're thinking and surviving in our gator brain. And I'm going to introduce again, my friend, Matthew Knoll. I don't know if you remember him, <laughs> uh, but he was the guy that just talked before me. Sometimes we forget easily about him, but um, he's gonna help me kind of demonstrate the, this idea of dopamine and how it's different when we introduce substances. On the left, you're going to see this visual of a bar graph, okay? And this is really just to give you a baseline of what um, someone's dopamine levels may look like. Everybody has different varying dopamine levels. And I do have to say, this disease of addiction is very complex. And so we are really just giving you this overview. So you can see that on an average day, we might be producing 0.5 nanograms per deciliter of dopamine per day. And then maybe we have a best day ever. Um, and, but we can see that it's kind of in the same range. But then once substances are introduced, they're being released at much more surges and higher rates. So I'm gonna have Matt, we're gonna, this is the first time we're doing this. And I'm so glad that we're not in person because and I can't see all of your faces um, because it might not work out the way we want it to, but bear with us. And I'm going to hand it over to Matt to give us another illustration. Well, thank all you right, for Matt, hyping this up, Donna. So, <laughs> all right. So Donna, tell me something in your life that just naturally makes you happy. Easy. My son, my son, Liam. What, Actually, what about him? he just... He, um, today was a remote learning day because here in York County, it had some freezing rain. So uh, he actually drew me a picture. I don't know if you can see it. It's a, it's a snowman. It, he just brought it into me and I was like, that, that just made me, it made my heart melt. So. And why did that make your me heart feel melt? Good. Is because, yeah. and I think I have some here. Let me look around. Where'd I put my, my dope up? Oh, there it is. We have some dopamine, right? So. As your son gave you that picture in your brain, Donna, you got some dopamine. So you ready? I'm going to throw it to you. Here you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Good. So, so you received some dopamine in your brain, Donna. How did that make you feel? It actually made me feel really good. I'm, I'm smiling. It made me feel good. <laughs> That's right. Because dopamine is that feel good, it, that feel good drug. So now, hey, Donna, this weekend, I'm having a party. Do you want to come over to my party? Well, first of all, how many people are going to be there and are they going to wear masks? Uh, yes, it is COVID safe, everything. Yes. Yeah, I'll come over. Okay. I, need, yeah. I need a break. I, let, I'll come over to your party. All right. So Donna comes over to my house and, hey, Donna, I got some marijuana. You ever smoked marijuana before? No. You want, you want to try it? All right. That sounds right. like a good idea. That sounds like a great idea, right? So Donna... <laughs> Um, tries marijuana for the first time, right? So all at once, she gets a whole bunch of dopamine fired at her. There you go. Uh, right? And her brain is overloaded. How, how are you feeling right now, Donna, with all that dopamine? I'm not going to lie, Matt. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> That's right. Because Donna, you know, received all that dopamine and she's high and, and she's feeling pretty good. So... The party comes and goes and everything. And hey, hey, Don, uh -oh. I'm, I'm, I'm having a party. Uh, you hit something. I did. <laughs> it was dopamine the dopamine, hit. I swear. <laughs> so, hey, next week, Don, I'm having another party. You want to come over again? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so Donna comes over and you want to smoke some more weed? Yeah, I really liked how that made me feel. Right. So again, Donna gets a whole massive amount of dopamine fired at her all at once. <laughs> And she's feeling really good. But now Donna starts smoking marijuana once a month. Now she's smoking it once a week. Now she's smoking it every day. Inside our brain, we have a section that makes the dopamine and fires it. And then we have another section that catches it. But these guys are getting really overworked, right? So what they do is they build a friend and they actually make more dopamine receptors to handle that massive amount of dopamine. This is where tolerance and the amount of use really comes into play. Donna soon finds out that that first time she only smoked a little bit and got all this dopamine, but 
now she's having to smoke a lot more to get that same effect, right? Her brain is actually changing. Now, can Donna smoke marijuana and say, brain, come on, I'm gonna smoke, but don't, don't change. No, she doesn't have control of that brain change. But now one day Donna comes home from work, right? And her son Liam comes running up, mommy, mommy, I made you a picture. And she shows you a picture. And what happens is Donna gets that original amount of dopamine. So here you go. Oh. <laughs> that was good. So how, how does that make you feel seeing that picture and getting that normal original amount of dopamine? It's not giving me, it's not giving me the same feeling. That's right. Okay. Because her, her body has changed. Um, and so Donna, what's the only thing that really makes you happy? Really? The only thing I'm thinking about is I, I need, I need that marijuana. I need right. it. Right. And this is where we see that big switch. It might've started as Donna at a party, experimenting, trying for the first time. But over time, her brain has changed. And now she no longer does the marijuana just to, to a party and you know try something. She's doing it to feel normal, just to be able to survive. See that brain change from the professor to the gator brain? And so she's having difficulty getting up to go to work without smoking up, right? And doing the things that, that she wants to love. And those things that were so important to her we kind of push aside. This is where we see those behavior changes. Their friends change. Someone might have always played basketball their entire life and now they no longer do that. Well, why not? Those things don't make you happy. So it's almost like they're drowning and they're just trying to really keep their head above water. But the more they use, the more our brain changes and, and it's a slippery slope that they're getting involved into some other unhealthy behaviors and everything. Now, if I can get Don into treatment, you know, we can hopefully get her brain to heal. So one day, just getting that normal amount of dopamine, she's happy again. Lots of times, even more happy because we're able to deal with some other things. Now, this was just a very, very simple demonstration and not, you can really get into the chemistry all of it. And it's a little bit more fun in person where I can throw ping pong balls or clementines at Donna. Um, but if you'd like more information about this or would like to share this with the youth, there's a great website called Mouse Party. And what you do is there's an aquarium full of mice and one's on um, using alcohol, another one's on marijuana, one's on uh, cocaine, he's like going crazy. And you pick up the little mouse by his tail and you put him in a little chair and it looks inside the brain. And it actually shows you because every drug and substance is a little bit different of how this process works. But what's going on in the brain and you can actually see this in an animal, they're not real mice, so no mice have been harmed, um, <laughs> but you can see that. So. Um, this is one demonstration and someone just put, um, you know, hopefully when you really learn the biology of addiction, it can really help reduce that stigma and even explain it to someone who's struggling. So I'm not a bad person. There's actually some things going on in my brain and chemicals changing. Yeah, it really can help them, you know, get the help that they need. So we hope you enjoyed our little demonstration. <laughs> but how does this um, impact the adolescent brain. And this is where uh, you really, especially if you're a parent, um, many providers on here may already know this, but if you're a parent, I want you to kind of lean in and take this in. Um, the adolescent brain, right, is still developing. By age 12, um, and in fact, it doesn't even mature um, fully until about the mid 20s. And for some people, not mention any names, Matt, about 27. So we know that by age 12, the brain starts to prune or sculpt um, back, they, you know, pruning back ineffective or weak or not used um, um, connections. So the brain cells that are frequently used are strengthened. The brain cells that are not being used, they're gone, they go away. Um, so really that idea of what fires together, wires together, um, and this is really huge and it's a critical time uh, for the development of the brain. And so these formative years can really shape a teen's behavior. So if we're introducing um, substances during this time, um, 
it's really going to affect that development. And we do know that the prefrontal cortex, our professor brain, um, is one of the last brain regions to develop. So a lot of times our teenagers are thinking in their gator brain already. Um, and we know that because they're thinking in the gator brain, um, these teens are more likely to engage in risky behaviors and have that impulse control not there, right? And the decisions that they make, you kind of look at them like, oh, don't be a knucklehead, right? Um, because they really are relying on that um, gator brain. With the introduction of substances and because the brain is developing, the negative impact can cause real problems with their memory, with their learning, with their attention, with their problem solving, with their impulse control, with their critical thinking, with their rational thought. I can go on and on and on with those skills that can actually last until into their adulthood. Um, so that's why delaying substance use um, is so important for their long-term over, overall health and well-being. The good news is um, there's this, even with that potential risk of all of those negative things, the good news is there is promise. The teen's brain is very, has lots of plasticity. So that means it's, it's um, what does it mean? It means it, it, it can form. <laughs> Um, it can change, it can adapt, it can respond to its environment. Um, and so things like putting challenging academics or mental activities or exercise uh, and, and getting them involved in creativity, neuroplasticity, thank you, Frank, um, they can really uh, help those positive neurons fire together. So we want them um, to learn those positive things so that they are being wired together. Um, so right now with adolescents, they're at a prime um, place in their life where they really can learn about their own brain and their own development and how substance use can um, impact them. So um, I wanna see who, who can give me uh, an amen for this. I, I, need, I need some amens here. It, it, it is as if a teenager's brain has a fully functional car accelerator, but the brakes have not been installed yet. Does anybody have a teenager in their house? Is this not the truest statement ever? Um, and it really is that we um, want to make sure that we help develop those car brakes, those brakes in their brain. Um, Mara says, it's so necessary that we normalize what it means to need help no matter the area of need. Amen to that, right? We really do need to make these conversation um, normal and, a part, and typical and a part of growing up. Um, the conversations about brain development, a great resource for that is NIDA for teens. Um, not only do they have information for teens that they can um, easily digest, but it's also a lot of resources for parents and how to start conversations. And um, so we're going to move into, now that we know all about, we're neuroscientists and we know all about the brain, we're gonna kind of move into the risk factors and protective factors of um, someone's vulnerability to substance use disorder or addiction. Um, and this is, just some common ones. There, there are a variety of risk factors for the sake of time. Um, we're just going to focus on four. Um, and it's important to remember that a risk factor for one person may not be a risk factor for another person, right? Um, so let's start with um, A, age of first use. We know, we just learned about how vulnerable the, the adolescent brain is and just a, a, a an adult brain is um, at risk for developing a substance use disorder. So the earlier an individual starts using a substance, the higher the risk for developing a substance use disorder is. Um, we know that those individuals that have started using um, before the a substance before the age of 15 are seven times more likelier to develop a substance use disorder. So the later we can push off experimenting or drinking or whatever, 
um, the better for the overall health um, of the brain and it will lessen the risk. B stands for a big life change. Um, I could sit here and we could probably name all kinds of things, right? So big life change can mean divorce. It can mean a global pandemic. Um, it can mean being bullied, moving, moving to a new school, moving to remote learning, um, trauma, like adverse childhood experiences. I think somebody had talked about that dating violence, um, finding um, or witnessing violence, uh, racism can be trauma. Um, so anything that is um, trauma related or a big life change can put you at risk. If you see a teen or your teen is struggling to cope with these big life changes, that is really important uh, to pay attention to because we want to make sure that they are learning skills in a healthy way um, to build their resilience so that they can manage those, um, those um, uh, uh, big life changes. C is for co-occurring mental, uh, co-occurring mental health or behavioral health dis uh, disorder. So up to 70% of adolescents with a mental or behavioral health disorder, like depression, anxiety, ADHD, PTSD, also have a substance use disorder. You watch that documentary series on 16 and recovering, pretty much every single student in that high school has a co-occurring uh, mental health or behavioral health disorder. Um, and then D, the genetics. We know that genetics plays a key role in the vulnerability of um, developing an addiction. So if there is a family history um, of addiction, alcoholism, substance use disorder, it really is important to have those conversations with your teen about that family history because we know that it puts them at risk, right? Um, now, I do need to say too, just because you're at risk um, doesn't mean, and just because addiction can happen to anyone, right? It doesn't mean that it will happen. So there is good news there. There is hope there. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the protective factors. And again, there's, there's a lot more uh, protective factors out there, but we're going to kind of focus on these. Um, the first one is community. So when a young person participates in a pro-social activity like um, uh, helping someone in need or volunteering or um, doing something that they are uh, working towards a common goal, um, they're going to start to foster and develop healthy connections with members of the community and also their peers that are also per, um, participating in the pro-social um, behaviors. Family is huge and that's, if you're a parent tonight, that's where you come in, right? Family is when um, our, our teens are, feel, when they feel like they are valued and they feel like they're part of the family and they're making meaningful contributions and they have purpose in that family. Um, and they have that foundation of a strong bond, they're less likely to engage in substance use and other problem behaviors. School, right? School is huge. It's gonna be different in, in this time. And Matt and Brittany are gonna talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted the risk and the protective factors. But we know that when um, we create safe supportive schools that support um, mental health services and drug and alcohol prevention services and ensure that the students are being supportive, um, that's going to only contribute to their success uh, and their overall health and well-being. So creating opportunities for our students to also be able to contribute to this community of school, um, they're, they're going to be less likely to engage in substance use. Um, the other is, uh, I think we, we talked about peers a little bit um, in, in why kids are using. Well, the opposite, of, that's true. So if they're hanging around negative peers that are using substances, they're gonna be at a greater risk, right? To start experimenting or trying, just like Matt tried to get me to smoke marijuana, right? So I might wanna change my friends like Brittany who would never do that to me. 
Um, but so when um, young people are surrounding themselves with positive uh, peers um, that, that share the same goals, they're going to be um, less likely to engage in antisocial behavior. So Matt, Brittany, how does COVID fit into all of this? Well, we, we felt it was important to address this, but this could be its own three hour, five hour seminar alone just on COVID. But we're in some really scary times right now. And personally, I'm very concerned of what the future looks like for youth and adults uh, alike. But going through those protective factors, you know, we can almost like scratch off a whole bunch of them because of the limitations that COVID has placed on us. Uh, one concern is the amount of screen time that our youth put in. Um, uh, you know, the kids just playing video games on their, their computers or on their cell phones and tiktok and everything else. We, we are concerned with the high numbers, but now the amount of screen time has even increased that much greater. And with this reduces that amount of just natural interaction with their peers. Um, all ages of kids, you know, have that increase in screen time because of schooling at home. Um, when can they just go run around and play four square or kickball? You know, like there's some really good protective factors and blowing off steam doing that interaction. So that screen time concern is, is, is a big one. That lack of just interaction with those peers of, of how they, they learn how to interact with them and speak publicly, publicly and speak in, in school if they're doing a project and things like that. We also recognize that for a lot of our kids, school is the most the safest place that they have in their daily life right that's where they get their meals that's where they interact with positive adults not everybody has a wonderful home that is supportive of them you know learning online and things like that and now so this pod this one positive place that they had that they felt safe was now removed from them so that's a big concern um, I know that we have some people, some of our prevention partners on here as well. And a lot of our prevention services, which we'll talk about in a little bit, take place in school. And it's extremely difficult for us to teach kids protective factors and how to say no and things like that when we have, uh, you know, our math and reading and writing, you know, going on virtually as well. And also it limits our extra set of eyes. Later we'll comment too on it takes a village. And I think we can all agree that it takes a village to raise a child. But as a parent, you know, I might not see some behaviors that my child's math teacher might take note of and, and recognize. So we have, you know, in school, but also on the playground or um, sporting events, you know, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H Club, whatever our kids are involved in, those are extra sets of eyes on our kids that, that just recognize when, you know, Matt, your son's just not himself lately. Is everything okay? And so we don't have that. Brittany, would you like to add to that? I think you just draw upon all the protective factors and risk factors Donna just talked about and how for some, like Matt just referenced, those risk factors are greater at home. And so children are spending more time in the home. And so if you don't have positive role models or perhaps you're in a home where there is abuse, how that's gonna carry over then into the impact long-term on our children and adolescents um, with mental health and substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. So really, I think why we're all here tonight, um, and I know we don't have much time, but we are gonna take some time to, to talk about this. What can we do? We have this foundation, we have this knowledge, we know that addiction is a disease, we know how it impacts the brain, we know the risk and protective factors, what can we do? Um, I'm gonna tell you something and I want you to listen closely. And if you need to write this down and make it personal, please do that. Parents are the biggest influence in a teen's life. If you have a sticky note or an index card or something, write this down. I am the biggest influence in my teen's life. I am the biggest influence in Liam's life. And so that has to be the foundation. You have to believe that moving forward in prevention. It may not feel right <laughs> because of how our teens um, react to us, but we're going to try to give you some tips on how to, how to 
engage them and bring them in. So one of the biggest things you can do is connect and talk. Easy peasy, we can all go home now. Go ahead, good luck, connect and talk. How do we do that? Um, especially with adolescents, because it is much easier as they're little and they think the world of us, but as they grow up and they wanna be um, independent and they wanna kind of carve their own way in this world, by staying involved, first of all, that's showing that you care and that you value them as a person. And I'm not talking about being nosy. I'm not talking about being intrusive or being a nag or, or just being annoying. I'm talking about showing an interest in who they are and what they're doing, showing an interest in who their friends are. And when their friends come over, showing an interest in, in making a connection with their friends and valuing their friends. Staying involved means putting aside distractions, putting down that phone, putting, turning off the screens and finding that quality time, uh, whether that's just one-on-one. -on -one. If you're a single parent and you're working and, and juggling remote learning and all of that, it is much harder. Um, and none, none of us here um, are saying that this is going to be easy, but connect and talking, staying involved is huge. Monitoring their social media is huge. How do you do that? Um, well, it is having those um, real conversations and finding opportunities to have those real conversations. Um, that see means seeking out those opportunities to talk with them about their life. And so I find one of the best ways to, to talk with a teen is being in a car driving somewhere. Number one, you don't have to make eye contact because for some reason, sometimes teens don't like you to look at them in the eye, whatever. And when you do look at them in the eye, they kind of roll their eyes, right? So sitting in a car, you can have these organic conversations about life, uh, who they're talking to on social media and what social media outlets are they using. Um, and then when they start talking and they feel safe and they start this, this um, back and forth, you know, listen, we are so um, used to interjecting and putting in our own ideas of what our child is supposed to think and what they're supposed to uh, believe. So I, I'm asking you to really listen. And as you're listening, um, start talking with them about that, uh, the drug and alcohol and nicotine use. This would be a great opportunity and approach that discussion with openness. So that means um, keeping an open mind, keeping um, you know, your bias to yourself and, and talking with them in non-judgmental ways so that they feel comfortable staying calm if they tell you something that their friends are doing, right? Um, and we wanna make sure that we're using open-ended questions to facilitate more discussion. We're not gonna just ask them, um, yes or no questions, because we know we're not going to really get any more in, um, answers other than yes or no. So um, exploring those open-ended questions. And then really, when you're listening, practice that active listening um, and reflective listening. So when you have a moment, reflect back on what they have just said. So you know that you've understood what they said and they feel heard. Um, everyone wants to feel valued. Everyone wants to feel heard. Um, so if you do have a concern about something that they're saying too, you can express your concern using I statements, right? Um, so if they start coming in and labeling your feelings, that's another one. So if, if they start coming in a little past curfew and you're worrying, instead of lecturing them, use that I statement of, um, you know, I'm concerned when you don't come in on time and make your curfew because I think something terrible has happened to you. And this will elicit some empathy from them. Um, and so you can then offer um, empathy to them so that when they do explain their side of the story, you can validate their feelings and you can let your child know that you're trying to understand um, and really acknowledge that uh, these are real concerns. I think one of the biggest um, approaches we can have is thinking back to when we wanted an adult to, to take us seriously and pay attention to us and, 
and um, have them really hear us and understand us. So when we can provide that support to um, your child, that lets you know that they can trust you. And in turn, you let them know that you really do want to trust them um, and that you guys can work collaboratively uh, to be healthy and make safe choices. Another great tip is to pay attention to the lights. And what I mean by that is when you're having a conversation and you know when the light is green, that means that your teen is engaged with you and they are um, willing to listen and they're responding constructively and appropriately. When you see, and as you're talking, when you're seeing kind of that shift and it, that yellow light comes on and you're seeing maybe they're kind of getting uncomfortable or they're starting, their attitude starts to change and they are, uh, maybe the body language is starting to, to kind of be closed off, right? We wanna be paying attention of when they're disengaging because the next light is what? A red light. So we um, are uh, going, to pay attention to the lights. And once we hit that red light, we know the conversation is over because we don't want it to escalate to yelling or screaming or um, going silent. So Matt, I think you have some things to, to point out too. Sure, uh, thank you, Donna. So some important things just to kind of know when we take a look at some prevention methods of how we can help our, our kids as well. Um, the problem with a lot of them is sometimes they were written by adults with adult brains in hopes to change adult behavior, but we're trying to change kids. And so what we, we really have to do is turn off our adult brain and put our adolescent brain on. And that's really, really difficult because as we can see from this list, um, adolescents are hardwired wired to be defensive about negative messaging. They're rebels, right? You tell them no, what are they going to do? They're going to try it, you know. Don't stick your finger in the outlet. You're gonna get electrocuted. What do they do? They stick their finger in the outlet, right? Um, they filter things much differently. Sometimes we as grownups think that we are going to, <clears throat> excuse me, put into a school a really powerful activity or maybe a car crash or show them some very, very powerful graphic image. And this is going to deter them from turning to drugs and alcohol. Did you take a look at their video games lately or a movie they're watching? They filter those things much differently than what we do, right? Um, and it's not as impactful for them because that part of their brain isn't even developed yet. High risk youth might be attracted to risky behavior. I have a 17 year old son and sometimes I just, they had a chair the other day tied to a four wheeler and it was just not a safe situation. We had to put an end to that, right? But when it came to risky behavior, there he's, he's all into that. Strong warning messages can send a sign that everyone is doing this. I heard a presentation once of, we could take the giant center at Hershey Park and fill it three times with the number of kids using, you know, marijuana. Oh, I'm not, maybe I'm missing out. That's sending a message that everyone is doing it. And maybe that's why I'm not accepted at school. So we have to be very careful with that. Um, they know when we talk about conspiracy theories, Kids are at the height of that when they know when they are being manipulated to behave or think differently. And so they're always kind of one up, wait, why are you telling me this? And once over presentations do not work because they send a message that, oh, we covered that. So going into a, a school or another activity and doing a presentation one time over, we would never teach our kids calculus in one day in a 45 minutes assembly right? It takes repetition and so does building these protective factors. So what are some um, positive uh, prevention strategies? Okay. What we want to do is teach kids what to do rather than what not to do. Don't do drugs really didn't work, you know? And so we want to remind them that majority of the youth do not use, right? They might think in their world that because of the circle of friends they're in, but in reality, most kids do not use or turn to drugs and alcohol. Guide them to, to make positive decisions. It's their decision. Let's give them the skills to make those decisions and show them healthy ways to cope and build uh, resilience. That's tough. I think that's a big area that we all can use 
um, some help on. So when we have those learning uh, situations, their girlfriend just broke up, their dog passed away, whatever it might be, how can we use that to build those coping mechanisms when they're having those yucky days and they're feeling down so it doesn't creep towards that depression? Um, the healthy resistance skills, we can all use those, but how do we even say no? You know, we, we heard from Nancy Reagan, just say no, but did we teach the kids how to say no? How to get out of a situation? Maybe even have a code word with mom and dad that I can just text you and you know when you see that, that I just need to be taken out of the situation. I need some help. And give them the opportunity to practice, right? It takes practice, but we have to hand over some trust to them to allow them to practice and then, you know, reevaluate that and be like, hey, how did that go tying that chair to the back of the four wheeler and you sitting in that? Was that a really healthy decision that you made? Probably not. So let's, let's take a look at that. So some things that we can do is you are able to talk to your school district. And sometimes we as professionals will go to a school district and say, hey, we would like some reoccurring evidence-based curriculum in the school. Here's the outcomes. This is awesome. And they might be like, okay, that's good. But, eh. but when parents call and say, hey, what are you doing besides having a mark mock car crash in the parking lot before prom are you doing some other things you guys really have a lot of power to help us get some good quality based reoccurring evidence based curriculum into the schools talk to the other adults in your child's life it takes a village right and so these are all those extra eyes if something yucky is going on in your child's life like maybe a death of a grandparent reach out to your school. Now that's your own personal choice, right? Um, but I know when I was going through those situations with my kids, I called the school. I said, I want every teacher to know. So if my son or daughter is having a yucky day, maybe not themselves, they, at least the staff knows, hey, there's something else going on in their life. Let's maybe pull them aside or just check in with them. Um, Talk to your uh, faith community and community centers. There's a lot of, of options out there for our children to be involved with. Um, in our schools, we have, um, well, there's many, many different appropriate wellness services for youth. Our SAP program or Students Assistance Program is just one of those. And that's the times they'll um, help identify that, hey, there's just something going on that's a concern. The concern for me is that most times those services are denied. Donna talked about one of the, the, the green light, the yellow light and the red light. That's a big light, right? And so embrace those things. Um, and we also have organizations um, out in the community that are able to produce quality-based educational or um, evidence-based reoccurring curriculums for prevention. Every county has a single county authority or an SCA and they have, um, partners with them that are out in the community and out into the schools doing some really, really good evidence-based, you know, curriculum. And sometimes we all get very passionate, like, oh, I want to go into the school and teach them this. Let's see what else is going on and making sure that we're really putting in quality services for our kids to learn from. So we're going to hand it over to Brittany because she's going to give us some real tangible um, things that we can do uh, to reduce the exposure. <clears throat> Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Matt. So I do know we're at seven o'clock, so we will try to move through the next couple of slides pretty quickly just to get you guys out. Um, and I appreciate you staying with us. We do have a lot of good tips still um, in the end of this presentation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about reducing exposure. We referenced in the beginning that early onset of substance use increases the chances of developing a substance use disorder later in life. So the primary goal of prevention, when we think about primary prevention, is to delay that first use or minimize potential use in the first place. So people are most likely to begin utilizing alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs during adolescence and early adulthood. So as adults, as community, we can really uh, do a lot of small, tangible things to reduce that potential for exposure. Uh, Donna, next slide. So it was mentioned earlier in the chat about parents using. And so parental attitudes favorable towards drug use goes a long way in terms of adolescents and children's perception and their perception of a permis the permission to use those substances. So 
sorry, I'm moving through my notes. Um, when we think about uh, our attitudes towards alcohol consumption, our attitudes towards utilizing marijuana, our attitudes towards nicotine, or our attitudes per towards prescriptions, children, children learn what they live. So if those substances are being used in the home, then they're learning them. And those substances could be used in the home and you can use them um, as prescribed if they're prescriptions, you could be using them. I mean, if you consume alcohol every now and then, if you smoke, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to teach your children that that behavior is always negative. Um, there is sometimes where alcohol consumption, you can use that, but when is the appropriate age? Educating, setting those boundaries about when, um, how adults can utilize these substances versus adolescents, um, especially around alcohol consumption, um, as well as prescriptions. You know, what is, when you receive a prescription, that is for you. So following it as prescribed, understanding the importance of that, understanding the, what your doctor encourages you to, to do when it comes to that prescription. Next slide, Donna. So substance accessibility in the community. This is one of those tangible things that all of us can help to reduce the access of um, substances. So 30%, and you can click through, Donna. So when we talk about alcohol, prescriptions, medical marijuana, and nicotine products, we know from the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, the 30%, 36% of youth in York County believe that it is easy to get alcohol. And that percentage is higher as they get older. And when we talk about prescriptions, we talk about opioids, we talk about stimulants, we talk about performance enhancing drugs, such as steroids, we talk about tran tranquilizers, such as Ambien or Xanax, and over-the-counter medications such as cough syrup. It's important that we control the access of all these substances for them to not be used as prescribed or not to be consumed by those who are not of age to consume. So substance accessibility in the community, substance accessibility in the home. Donna, next slide. So one of the things I'm gonna to touch upon is ensuring proper storage and disposal of medications. So 44% of youth in York County who reported prescription drug abuse reported they took them from a family member living in their home. And 24% of youth in York County reported access to prescription painkillers as easy or very easy. Uh, next slide, Donna. So I know this is a little bit hard to read because it's, um, it's a graph and the font might be a little bit small, but I just want to point out two columns. So the first column is where youth in York County in 2019 are reporting they received prescriptions. And the first one is they took them from a family member living in the home. And as you can see, that is the highest graph. So that's concerning. Children are getting prescriptions in the home. They're, they perceive that the accessibility of prescriptions are higher in the home, and that's where they're getting them. And um, the other higher chart is they friends or family give them to them. So coming back to an earlier point I made, it's important to educate about the importance of taking a prescription as prescribed. I know it's very easy if you have cough syrup with codeine that you might have got from um, from having bronchitis or something else, you know, and if someone in your family develops a cough, oh, this can help. Prescriptions are to be taken as prescribed to those who's, to that individual who it was prescribed. So it's important to educate about that um, and enforce that behavior because um, your children learn that. They learn that. They see that, okay, well, it's acceptable to utilize someone's else prescription. Um, and so then the risk is lower. And then that, uh, coming back to that brain chemistry, willingness to engage in risky behaviors, you know, trying to self-medicate, they understand that, that prescriptions, um, the risk of taking someone else's prescription is not as high. So they're willing to engage in that potential behavior. And next slide, Donna. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is a simple act. So um, as parents, as caregivers, as a community, we can all, um, safely store our meds. So one, you can use a lock box, you can use a lock bag. Um, this is a sample of a lock bag. It kind of looks like a money bag if you ever worked in um, like retail or if you ever 
worked in a bank, it's kind of very similar to that. Um, you can utilize that to safely store your medications, a locked medicine cabinet. Also make sure you keep track of your medications and not just prescriptions, but also over-the-counter medications as well. Um, know what you have, know the quantity of what you have um, and where are you storing it in your home? Are you keeping it right, off, right out on the counter in the bathroom? Are you keeping it in the kitchen? Or are you locking it in your bedroom or locking it in the medicine cabinet like I referenced earlier? Where are you storing your meds? And then how do you get rid of your meds when you're done with them? So when you're no longer using it, maybe the prescription was discontinued by your doctor. Maybe it's expired. Maybe you got it just for one time illness and you no longer need it. Are you keeping it? Are you hoarding, are you hoarding your medications for a long time? Or are you getting rid of them? And so we have a few different ways you can get rid of medications. You can use a medication deactivation kit. This is a fairly new concept to many. Many are probably not familiar with what a medication deactivation kit is, but this is a safe way to dispose medications at home. And so some pharmacies carry them, some you can order online, um, but this is an example of one. It's probably a little bit hard to see, but basically what you do is you pour your meds in here, you add some tap water, you shake it on up, you seal it, and you throw it in the trash. It's safer for the environment. It breaks down the medications, reducing the potential for them to be misused, misused or reused. Home disposal. Let's say you don't have a deactivation kit and you want to know how to get rid of your home, your medications at home. Um, you can mix them in kitty litter or you can mix them in little coffee grinds um, and place them in a container you, and then throw them in the trash. You also want to make sure when you throw away your medication, if you have prescriptions, scratch out your information before you throw those bottles in the trash. You can also participate in drug take back events. So occasionally throughout the year, communities will have events to take back medications. We also have permanent drop off boxes in various different um, pharmacies, as well as majority of our police stations throughout York County. And so I, again, I know this spot is really little, but later on we'll have some websites where you can get more of this information. And so, I believe I am turning it over to Matt now. We do have some final thoughts, Matt, uh, but in the sake of time, uh, you know, these will be in our um, PowerPoint that you'll receive um, from uh, Human Services. Um, We've really focused on adolescents, but really you can start these um, talks and discussions and staying involved at any age. So we do have some tips for talking to children um, ages four to eight um, and also ages nine um, to 13. We do want to just kind of remind you that our kids are watching. Kids of all ages are watching us, including our, so are we relying on our coffee? Are we relying on nicotine? Are we, you know, every time there's a celebration or if we're sad, are we having a drink? Are we lighting up something else? Um, so really we wanna just encourage you to be mindful of, of what you're modeling for our children and uh, being aware of transitions in life. It's okay to ask for help. It does truly take a village. And if you need help, uh, you can notify the village. We're gonna provide you some with, with some resources, um, including partnership to end addiction. And if you feel that your child is struggling with a substance use disorder, you can have, um, you can reach out to the partnership at drugfree.org. They can hook you up with a parent coach. I am a parent coach. Um, and we're able to help you navigate through um, and kind of unlayer this new world of substance use for, uh, for your, your child. Um, we also want to talk to or give you the COVID-19 uh, toolkit through the CDC. There's some great tools in there for you um, to help navigate COVID that's still ongoing. Um, and for whoever knows that uncertainty of, of when um, this whole thing is going to be over. So I encourage you to reach out to them as well. Um, I'm going to let Matt talk about the Goodenzia helpline. If you or a loved one uh, does need um, any 
uh, help getting into treatment. Uh, Gedemzi does now have a 24-7 helpline that you can call 24-7. Um, that if um, you're someone needs withdrawal management or you just want to talk to somebody or you have questions, you're welcome to call that number. And that's really nice because uh, typically when someone who needs help finally says, yep, I need some help, we have to act now. And so we're really proud to host that number and you're welcome to use it whenever needed. Thank you. And so this is just our um, contact information. There's mine, there's Matthew's, and there is Brittany's. And we do always want to leave you some with some other um, crisis hotlines, um, especially during COVID-19. Um, this is, I always like to end with a quote. So seek first to understand, then to be understood. We want to thank you so much for sticking it out with us. Sorry, we went over about 15 minutes. I blame Matt. He likes to talk a lot. Um, but I'm going to turn it back over to Colleen. All right, everyone. Uh, I want to say a quick thank you to Donna and Brittany and Matt. Appreciate all the information you gave us. Rest assured, um, all of you will be receiving um, a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a, a video um, link. And we encourage you, if you want to um, have a QR code here on the screen, this will drive you to other resources in addition to what Donna shared with you. Um, so feel free to I'll leave that up for a few minutes before we conclude um, the event. And then I'll take you to some York Adams Drug and Alcohol Commission resources. So thanks everyone and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Good job, y'all. Oh, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Good job, Donna. Good job, Matt. You too, Brittany. Wonderful job. <laughs> Good job, guys. A lot of good information. A team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could we could actually talk more. And you, honestly, if if anyone has questions, certainly um, please reach out to us. Those that are still on. Um, so I'll download the information and. Um, the slides, and then I will send that out to, to everyone who registered, whether they could be on or not. And Colleen, we need to talk about how to get, I did have some people that want uh, the recording of this because they weren't able to be here tonight. Um, so how to get that to people. Yeah, I'll send that along with the PowerPoint. I'll send the link. Okay, great. Yep, so I'll download it and send it out. Colleen, when you um, send it out to the group, I put it in the chat, but if there's any service providers on here that needs medication storage um, to disseminate to their consumers or medication deactivation systems, um, they can reach out to the collaborative. We actually do have a community program to disseminate that information. Um, so, Okay. Can you, can you just email that to me? Because I'll that just with all that deactivation thing that you just said. I didn't know that that was available. That would be great. If you guys actually want to send me, um, I guess it's all in your contact information, right? Um, I'll also put your names and email addresses on the letter, the email to everyone just so they can have that at their fingertips. Oh, but that's on the PowerPoint. That's right, you guys had it in the PowerPoint. Um, Are we, we able to link the video like through Facebook or yeah. anything like that? I was gonna upload it to um, YouTube. Yeah. yeah, because then you could pull it. Great. Yeah, that, that would be really good. But yeah, for the first time through, like you practice, you rehearse. Oh, well, let's but... stop recording. Oh.